What is up you guys? So in this one, we're going to talk about the minimum cost network flow problem. So network flow has a lot of applications in combinatorial optimization in particular. It is a class of computational problems in which the input is a flow network as we will discuss in this lecture. So we've got some supply and demand going on and some nodes should act as suppliers coming from an external flow, whereas others act as demanding nodes. They're demanding certain units coming from a supplier and we should be able to find the optimal flow so as to push units as cheap as possible so that the demanding nodes could deposit the units outside the network. The demanding nodes are also referred to as sync. They're sync terminals. So in this case, it's terminals one and two. Whereas terminal three acting as a supplier is referred to as the source terminal. Other types of network flow problems include the max cut or the nowhere zero flow. You've also got max flow, min cut, network flow problems. And there is really many algorithms in the field of combinatorial optimization dedicated for such types of problems, including the Ford fault Fulkerson algorithm that is a greedy one and is dedicated for the maximum flow problem. You've got a simplex version, so simplex is dedicated for linear programs, and you've got a network simplex algorithm that is based on, of course, linear programming. You've got also the edmunds karp algorithm that runs in polynomial time and is dedicated for the maximum flow problem. We've also got the Dynix algorithm, which has the same characteristics as edmunds karp So in this lecture, we're going to approach this problem using convex optimization. That is, we're going to formulate the problem as a linear program. And finally, use MATLAB to solve that linear program. We're going to give interpretations about what it means to have an optimal flow. How is it optimal? In which sense? So without further ado, let's get started. Right, so I'm going to start off with a simple example as I did in previous convex optimization application lectures. And through an example, we'll try to give also intuition and background on how to understand the solution of the problem. So let's say I've got three nodes, right? And nodes are connected through path to push units from one to three. I need to pay a cost of two. So it's a cost of two per unit and vice versa. To go from three to one, the cost is one. Now let's fill in the network with some random costs. So to go from, let's say from one to two, I have to pay one per unit, two to one, I have to pay three per unit and so on. And on top of that, there has to be some supply and demand going on. Otherwise there is nothing to push really and nothing to supply, right? So let's say node three is the supplier. So I've got an arrow coming from outside the network. We'll call it B3 for node three, B1 for node one and B2 for node two. Okay, so the Bs are actually referred to as external supplies, right? So if B happens to be negative, means it's pointing inwards. Positive, it's pointing outwards. But what does that really mean? So if BK is negative, that means node K is actually supplying, right? If it's positive, means it's demanding, right? So let's say, oh, and one more thing, so that we have the, the notion of supply and demand, we should force that the sum of BK and actually the BKs are known, right? So the sum of BKs are zero. K is in S. So S is the set of nodes one to three. So B1 plus B2 plus B3 is zero. How could you understand this? Well, let's say node three is supplying. So let's say B3 is minus two. We have two units per time coming from outside the network. This means that B1 plus B2 should add up to two. Okay, so let's say for the moment that B1 is demanding one unit and so does B2, right? Um, the problem here is what is the path I should push units from three to one and two so that the total cost of the transportation is minimum. So if we denote by Xij to be the flow from node I 
to know J and Cig to be the cost per unit from I to J. So let's say you're pushing, I don't know, two units from three to one. What is the total cost? It's X31 multiplied by C31, which is one, right? So now we have all the C's, right? Which are, which could be stacked in a matrix. So if we denote matrix C, where it's I, J entry is simply lowercase C, I, J, right? The matrix C is filled out as follows. So to go from one to one, we don't have a cost. So it's zero. To go from one to two, it's one. To go from one to three, it's two. To go from two to one, it's three. From two to two, it's zero. From two to three, it's one. Three to one, it's one. Three to two, it's five. And three to three, it's zero again, right? So my CIJs, I have them. What is the total cost of the network? So the total cost is simply the summation over IJ where i is going from one to three, and so does j, c i j multiplied by x i j, right? Which I want to minimize, right? Um, the problem here is to find the x's, and definitely most of the x's that we're going to have, nine variables, are going to be set to zero, right? Due to the nature of the problem. So we say that the solution here is sparse. So we have an optimization problem here in X I J's, right? And so what are the constraints? The first constraint that we could think of is that at each node, we can impose a conservation of flow. That is the total flow in equals to the total flow out, right? So that said, if I am standing at any node, let's say at node I, the sum of x i j should be equal to the sum of x j i. So x i j is everything leaving i, whereas x j i is everything entering node i, right? And one more thing, we shouldn't forget about the external flow. Since we assume that it is positive when we have demand, that is when we're pointing outwards, then outwards means leaving, right? So leaving, we should add it here, plus bi. If we had the other sense around, if we had that bk is negative upon demand and bk is positive upon supply, then we should add the bi on the right hand side, meaning that it's entering, right? It's just a matter of sense, nothing much. So here are your constraints and that's it. So we have our problem to optimize. What is it? So we have to minimize the total cost that is again cij xij subject to the conservation of flow that is sum out plus external is equal to the sum in for each i for each node right so from one to n in our case it's three right and one more thing we assume to have a bounded problem we're going to limit each x i j right between say zero and some upper limit it could be variable it could be u i j but for the moment i'm going to leave it as u so u as an upper bound right what is this type of problem since we're minimizing only with respect to my x i j's which appear to be linear in the cost and the constraints then the problem is a linear program, right? We've got a linear program. And I have a lecture in my other series entitled Convex Optimization, and in particular, lecture five, where I extensively talk about this topic, including solvers for this program, one of which is the simplex method by Danzig. Voila, this is what we have. Now, it will turn out to be useful to write this in vector form. That is, let's stack in one vector C, my Cij, so C11, C12, C13, then since it's done over here, 11, 12, 13, then we go 21, then 22, then 23, right? Which, if I copy the values correctly, will turn out to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, and 1, 5, 0, right? So this is the vector C. Now, in a very similar way, let's stack all the elements of x, i, j in one vector as C. So that said, my x will be x11, x12, 
x13, x21, down to x33, right? This is my x vector. So my cost could be expressed as minimizing with respect to vector x, c transpose x, right? Where c transpose x is this sum over here. Let me write it in blue. Let me leave the x in white. Now subject to, now if my x looks like this, then over here, I've got a, so if I have n nodes, so then x is of size n square. So in other words, x belongs in R n square, right? Then we can express a matrix A over here that is in R. Since I have n constraints, then we have n rows by n square columns. And A, this guy over here could be expressed as Ax equal to minus B, right? Where my B, or if you want, I could write B and A in red. So my B is external forces, B1, B2, in this case, it stops at B3, which in this case is just the vector 1, 1, and minus 2, right? So there you go. We still have A. So what is A in this case? Um, A could be chosen, really, um, just choose it according to the problem. So according to the geometry you have, you figure out A. So in this case, if we were to configure A, um, it will look something like this. So since the columns are indexed by as x11, x12, x13, then x21, 2223, then if we get this guy on the other side, we've got a minus. So all nodes leaving are multiplied by a plus one, whereas the ones entering are multiplied by a minus one. So if we stand at one, that is row one, who's leaving one? We've got one three and we've got one two, right? So one, two is right here and one, three is right here. Then we have the got three, one entering one and two, one entering one. So this guy is two, one, as this is one, 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 two, one, three, then this is two, one. You don't have a two, two, neither do we have a two, three, then a three, one, three, two, three, three. Likewise, when you stand at node two, you can figure out that the second row will look like this, zero, minus one, zero, so on. And row three, that is associated with node three, and that's it. So this is my A matrix, is here. And I have one more constraint, that is this guy over here. So this is easily imposed as U multiplied by the all ones vector. Now let's solve this problem that we have on MATLAB. I'm going to create a new script, call it main. And in this script, I will First, configure my C, which is over here. I'll just copy paste those values right here. Not copy paste them because I'm just, just copying them, right? There you go. Now, let me fill in B. So my B is one, one and minus two, right? Let's fill in A, which is over here. So zero, one, one, minus one, zero, zero, minus one, zero, zero. Then that's the first row. Now the second row is row minus one, zero, zero, one, zero, minus zero. Right? Then the last row over here is simply just zero, zero, minus one, zero, zero, minus one, then a one, one, zero. Okay? So that's it. Um, now we're ready to solve the problem using linprog as such. Pass it to your C vector, right? We don't have any inequalities other than this one, but this one is a special type of inequality because the X's are not weighted. So we can fill them up using, using other variables. Now we'll see. So we don't have any inequalities. Then for equalities, we've got AX equal to minus B. So a minus B goes here and you've got a lower bound. So for the lower bound, we're going to say that it is LB and we've got an upper bound that is UB. We're going to start at x0 and we're going to pass some options, right? So for LB, over here, this x, oh, we forgot the lower bound. There you go. But this guy, we forgot it. It's just the zero vector. So that's the LB, right? So it's a zeros of size, um, in this case it's nine, so nine by one. And an upper bound, which is U times the one vector, well, we don't know it, so we can leave it unbounded, okay, as such. Now for the options, the options in this case is important. 
So we're going to use the optum option. We will specify that we're using the len prog and as an algorithm, we're going to use the dual simplex. You could experiment with other algorithms, but I'll stick with that. And we're going to display each iteration, okay? Now, there you go. Let's try to solve this. Run, x0 is undefined. I'm sorry about that. So X zero. Now, if you don't have a starting point, you could just leave it empty as such. Okay. Run again. So two iterations is to finish. And let's print out the solution. I'm going to call this X opt, X optimal. Run again. And there you go. This is your optimal X, right? So what does that mean? Going back up here, the optimal flow, everything is zero except this guy and this guy. Well, what are those? Again, we started X one one and this one is X one two so x one two is part of the optimal flow this path in green is part of the optimal flow and we've got this guy over here which is x three one that is from here till here okay so there you go now what does that mean it means that if i have two units coming into node three then to get them out of the system via node one that is demanding one unit from those two and one unit for node two. I'm going to push both units from node three to node one, okay? Then node one will meet the demands at B1 and then pass the other unit to node two so that it meets its own demands. Is that clear? Oh, by the way, there's a mistake over here. This one is pointing inwards and this guy is pointing outwards, right? If, if this was pointing inwards, then, then the problem would have had a different solution. So that's the case because if it was pointing till two, then another part of this solution would be to push each unit separately, one via one and the other one via node two, right? Um, so let's experiment and see what other cases we can get. Let's say this path over here was too expensive. Let's replace this by a 10. What would you think the solution would be if I replace this with a 10? No, three would not prefer to pass the units onto this path, right? Because it already has a cheaper one over here, which is five. So you could push through five and then you could push through this guy over here. Let's modify this in the program. So right here, this guy is three one. So the way to change it is over here. Instead of one, I've got a 10, okay? Let me run this and there you go. What is the solution now? It is via two one. So two one, so this guy, which has a cost of three, right? And three two, so this path over here, which has a cost of five. So now the optimal flow is different. It would choose to pass units via this path. So two times five, that's 10. It will cost 10 over here, one for the B2 supply, and the other one would pass from two to one for the B1 supply. That's a total cost of two times five, that's 10, plus one times three will get 13, so 13. If I were to choose the optimal path for the previous problem, I would have had two times two path two over here. So that's two times 10, that's 20 plus one, that's a 21. So it will cost me more. Now let's see if I could find another path. Let's say I push one here and one here. That's 15, right? Still this path beats it. So this path is 13, two times five plus one times three, that's 13. Again, if I chose one here and one here, that's 15. If I passed both here, then passed one here, that's a 21. So what we found here is indeed the optimal solution. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. If you found it beneficial, please leave a thumbs up on this video. Consider subscribing to my channel. And really, if you have any questions whatsoever or any sort of optimization problem that you would like to see me explain or demonstrate, um, just leave a comment down in the comment section below and I'll make sure I'll get to it as soon as possible. Thank you so much and I'll see you in future lectures.